Good morning. We are pleased to welcome you to this virtual conference organized jointly by ICD Quebec and ICAP on the purpose of the corporation and the stakeholder model. The enthusiasm generated by this event testifies to the importance of the subject, as well as to the quality of the two invited speakers. My name is Francois Dauphin, and as of June 1st, uh, 2020, I am the president and CEO of ICAP. Today's event serves also to highlight the fact that our institute is celebrating its 15th anniversary this month. Created in 2005 by a generous donation from the Stephen Jaroslavsky Foundation and the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, as well as the financial participation of two academic institutions, HEC Montréal and the John Molson School of Business from Concordia, the Institute for Governance has also been supported by an array of private and public sector organizations. Over the last 15 years, EGOP has become a credible reference on all matters of governance. Under the leadership of Executive Chair Dr. Rivan Allaire and Director General Mr. Michel Nadeau, IGAP has published 11 policy papers, 42 research reports, and over 630 news articles, interviews, or presences in the media. Over the past 15 years, no fewer than 8,600 persons from over 500 different organizations have taken part in governance training sessions, roundtable discussions, seminars, and conferences, all designed to help them play a more engaged and proactive role within their respective organizations. With its cutting-edge research, training programs, policy papers, and participation in public debates, EGOT has fashioned a unique place in the field of governance. Fifteen years have passed, but our mission remains judicious as the field of governance continues to evolve and new challenges emerge. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our moderator for this conference. Chair of the ICD Quebec Chapter, Director of Metro, PSP, National Bank of Canada and Gildan, M&A and Corporate Finance Lawyer for 30 years, Vice Chair of the Board of Governors at McGill University, Advocatus Emeritus. She holds a law degree from McGill University and a Master in Risk Management from New York University Stern School of Business. I give you Marie's Bertrand. Merci, François. Bonjour, bienvenue tout le monde. Bienvenue, merci d'être avec nous ce matin pour notre conférence sur la gouvernance. Euh, comme François l'a indiqué, elle va se dérouler en anglais. So, without further ado, I will switch to, uh, to Shakespeare's uh, uh, tongue. It's a double pleasure for me to be uh, the host of this panel this morning. I say double, of course, because we have the privilege of having with us virtually uh, not one, but two giants of, uh, of the governance milieu, Martin Lipton and Yvan Allaire, uh, and I will introduce them more formally in a minute. Uh, it will be indeed a, a privilege, I think, for our group to hear our guests discuss their respective uh, perspectives on the shift toward uh, stakeholder governance and, uh, you know, the older sibling ESG and the challenges that are associated with uh, the proposed new model. Some are calling this a tectonic shift. Uh, we in Canada have actually lived with a version of this model for a while, since 2008, the su Supreme Court decision in, uh, in BCE. But we will see that uh, it's, uh, it's a very topical uh, subject right now. So before I introduce our guests, uh, I just want to say a word about uh, our organization, uh, the Quebec chapter of the, of the ICD, the Institute of Corporate Directors. We are an association that's dedicated to leading and promoting excellence on corporate boards and strengthening gov governance and the performance of organizations. So this morning's event, definitely part of the ICD's mission, which is to educate and enlighten uh, our uh, corporate directors. Um, I will add for the benefit of our, of our uh, panelists that uh, this morning's audience is actually largely composed of corporate directors and, and other followers of uh, governance trends and, and developments. So our first guest is Martin Lipton. Um, he scarcely needs introduction, but I, uh, I am going to give you the full bio. Uh, Martin is the founding partner of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, uh, specializing in uh, advising major corporations on M&A and matters affecting corporate policy and strategy. Martin, of course, is a foremost authority on corporate law and uh, well known for having invented the poison pill defense, a tool which I used all of my career as, a, as an M&A lawyer myself uh, to defense, uh, uh, to, to block hostile takeovers. And it has been described, and I don't think it's an exaggeration, as one of the most important innovations in corporate law. 
Martin is also a celebrated thought leader in corporate governance and his article, The New Paradigm, issued under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, uh, has become a template for rejuvenated corporate governance, and he will speak to us about that. He is an adjunct professor of law at New York University School of Law, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. Our second guest is Dr. Yvan Allaire, who also probably needs no further introduction, but again, here is the full bio. Dr. Allaire is the chair of the board of the Institute for Governance, EGAP, and Emeritus Professor of Strategy. He has written extensively on corporate strategy and governance. He was the co-founder of the CECA Strategy Group and Executive Vice President of Bombardier from 1996 to 2001. Dr. Allaire has been a board member of uh, several listed uh, corporations and public organizations. He was the chair of the Global Council on the Role of Business of the World Economic Forum. He holds a BSc uh, in, uh, in Commerce Summa Cum Laude, an MBA from the University of Sherbrooke, and a PhD from MIT. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a Chevalier de l'Ordre de Montréal. So we have two Chevaliers with us uh, this morning. Without horses. So thank you. Thank you both for being with us this morning. Um, we will first give the floor to uh, Martin to discuss the new paradigm and its evolution from the Milton Friedman credo of profits first to today's more uh, stakeholder centric uh, notion. Then Ivan uh, will um, bring us back to the Canadian context a little bit and then the two of you will discuss the challenges and the thornier questions associated with the stakeholder model. Just a word on audience participation. It is important for us, and you can send your questions via the platform during the conference. We will try to address them throughout, but for purposes of flow, uh, I probably will uh, wait until the end of the, of, of the session at 11.45 when we have a full 15 minutes of uh, questions to, uh, to bring them, uh, to, bring them to, our, to our panelists. So without further ado, Martin, uh, Talk to us about the new paradigm. Well, I will talk about the new paradigm. First, I do have to say that um, Dr. Allaire is one of the uh, people I most admire in, uh, in terms of thinking about corporate governance. We sort of found each other by exchanging articles um, a dozen years or so ago, and we have basically a long distance um, internet uh, friendship, but I consider Dr. Lair to be one of the world's leading experts on corporate governance, and it's a great honor and uh, privilege for me to uh, work with him on, on this program. Um, uh, with that, I'll, I'll switch to the new paradigm New paradigm is really an old paradigm. Uh, it, um, it goes back, uh, I would say, to um, the uh, beginning of um, corporate governance, um, which I always date to the exchange in 1932 of uh, law review articles by Adolf Burley and Merrick Dodd. I'm not going to burden you with this history, but we have been debating uh, corporate governance essentially since then with long and interregnums uh, uh, before there were significant uh, developments. I think the, the first real significant development was in the 1960s um, when um, uh, both uh, Milton Friedman wrote his first treatise um, in which um, 1962 um, in, in which he put forward the idea of shareholder primacy that corporations should be run with the uh, basic policy of maximizing value for the shareholders and uh, that no other consideration should enter in other than complying with law and ethics that uh, as long as you complied with law and ethics you should um, 
concentrate fully and only on maximizing profits for shareholders. Uh, in the same period in the 60s, we began to experience in the United States uh, um, growth in takeovers and proxy fights to the point where by 1968, we had adopted the Williams Act in the US to govern, uh, regulate um, takeovers, including hostile takeovers. And then in 1970, um, uh, Milton Friedman uh, published an article in the New York Times, um, New York Times Magazine, uh, putting forward uh, his ideas with respect to um, shareholder primacy. And in one of those not normal uh, situations in uh, issues of this type, it sort of took off. Uh, and um, uh, there are not very many instances where an article in a newspaper has had such an impact on um, uh, both economics and law. Um, and um, uh, I think it's fair to say that starting with his article in 1970, uh, um, uh, um, the, um, the business schools, not just in the U.S., but I think the business schools pretty much in the Western world in any event, uh, basically began to teach uh, shareholder primacy as uh, the objective for uh, corporate officers, not just the directors of companies, but the whole idea was you run a company in order to maximize profits for the shareholders. And uh, that concept really backed up the great growth in proxy fights and hostile takeovers that began in the 70s and continued to um, really uh, be a dominant factor in, the, uh, in Western economies in the 1980s and 90s. Um, prior to that time, it was generally considered that a corporation was managed in order to have increasing dividends on a regular basis that each year a company would um, um, pay dividends uh, that um, would show a three or a five percent increase over the previous year. And those were the companies that were most desirable. During this period, there was a great shift in the way companies were viewed as investments to total shareholder return. That uh, you measured uh, the value of a security as by what the total return was, and pretty soon it was the total return on a quarterly basis. So that the combination of competition among asset managers, institutional investors, concept of total uh, shareholder return, put enormous pressure on companies uh, to um, uh, produce short-term profits, to show increase in profits on a quarterly basis. And um, that um, continued as the um, basic, um, I call it, uh, corporate management philosophy through uh, with very little dispute, very little. There were um, um, prominent economists, there were some lawyers and law professors who viewed it differently, but I think it's fair to say that it was the dominant um, 
uh, view uh, until 2008. In 2008, uh, it, it became crystal clear from uh, the financial crisis and that clearly had been brought about by short-termism and competition uh, to increase quarterly profits. So there was something not quite right about it. And that gave rise to a more general re-examination of um, philosophy. Um, and um, I personally had in 1979 uh, uh, written an article, um, uh, admittedly the, the reason why I wrote it was in connection with justifying the action of directors in rejecting hostile takeovers, but the article um, presented the theoretical argument for stakeholder older, uh, governance. And in it, I argued that the law was that a board of directors would should consider the interest of all stakeholders in making determinations, not just in connection with takeovers, but connection with with this. In any event, without boring you with uh, um, back and forth that continued over that period, uh, um, starting in, in 2009, uh, I sort of increased um, my focus on trying to get a change um, in um, uh, how this was viewed. Concurrently, uh, the World Economic Forum, from a somewhat different standpoint, focusing on inequality and um, um, uh, climate uh, problems, uh, was putting forward uh, um, a strenuous effort on uh, having boards pay attention to ESG, environmental, social, and governance, uh, matters. And, and there is, of course, um, a concurrence between ESG governance and stakeholder governance. They're essentially the same thing. Um, the scope of stakeholders goes far beyond just employees, shareholders, customers, and suppliers. It includes the communities and the scope of communities includes the economy as a whole um, and um, um, the environment as a whole. Um, a number of us were writing articles at this point. Dr. O'Leary was writing articles, I was writing articles. Um, and um, in um, uh, 2014, uh, uh, the World Economic uh, Forum, uh, actually the International Business Council of the World Economic uh, Forum, asked me uh, to um, uh, prepare a paper um, um, uh, reflecting articles that I had written and some of the articles I had put forward the idea of a new paradigm and um, that they, we should uh, totally abandon the idea of um, um, uh, shareholder primacy and uh, the uh, proper way to view uh, corporate governance was from a stakeholder and ESG standpoint. Ultimately, um, after um, uh, going through drafts, uh, uh, consultation with uh, public companies, um, um, uh, two sessions with the International Business Council in September of 2016, uh, the new paradigm was published by the World Economic Forum. And it, it's really a, a quite simple, it was, not a, it was not a new, new paradigm. It was a new paradigm. Um, 
borrowing solely and only from old experiences and legislation, regulation, and um, uh, articles that had uh, essentially been accumulating from 2008. Uh, and the new paradigm is a very simple structure. Uh, companies, you run your governance, the relationship between your shareholders and your board of directors and the management company in accordance with uh, best practices that um, provide uh, understanding among both the shareholders, the management, and the board of directors as to the proper way in which the company should be run. Companies should be run to achieve long-term sustainable growth in value, and they should be run with regard to sustainability, with regard to the ESG factors, with regard to the employees, the customers, the suppliers, the communities in which the companies operate. And on the other hand, uh, the institutional investors and the asset managers, who by this time had come to dominate uh, the world of large public companies with relatively few um, major institutions uh, having effective control of most of the big listed companies, uh, you have to endorse the same principles with respect to stakeholders and sustainability and so on. And the way in which you should operate and the way in which corporations should operate is to engage with each other so that there is a balance. You have, confer you have conferred with the companies and the companies have conferred with you and have reached a voluntary understanding as to how the company's strategy should evolve and how the company should um, basically allocate among the stakeholders of the company. And that in effect, uh, the companies would follow principles that were satisfactory to the shareholders in terms of how the companies would operate and determine their strategy. And on the other hand, the investors uh, would embrace the same principles uh, with respect to ESG and stakeholders and uh, the resolution of the allocation would come about through engagement between the um, corporations and the uh, investors. And that's the new paradigm. The new paradigm is basically, on the one hand, corporations will follow what came to be called best practices with respect to governance, the relationship with shareholders, and the relationship with directors and the management. And um, the investors uh, would follow stewardship principles that uh, basically coordinated and co coincided with the uh, ESG and stakeholder principles um, of the corporation. And differences and emphasis would be worked out through engagement between the shareholders and the companies. Uh, and that's the new paradigm. It was published in September of 2016. Um, 
uh, in 2017, in January, it was surfaced at uh, Davos uh, uh, at the meeting of the World Economic Forum. Uh, some well over 100 major companies and investors signed a compact uh, um, that they would essentially pay attention to it. Uh, the new paradigm itself is not an explicit agreement between companies and shareholders. It's an implicit agreement, each um, in effect saying to the other, these are the principles with respect to stakeholder and ES governance that we believe in, and we will engage with each other to work out the details of it. Uh, that concept uh, was not new in 2016. It was not too new in 2014. Um, the uh, Financial Reporting Council in the UK um, had already uh, um, basically um, required, or at least uh, required in the UK sense of doing it or explaining why you're not doing it. Uh, institutions disclosing their position with respect to um, ESG and stakeholder uh, uh, management. So the Companies Act of 2006 um, uh, basically uh, um, has a stakeholder um, governance uh, provision in the UK. So this, this was not new in 2016. This built on statutes that had been adopted in the US and elsewhere. Um, and um, um, uh, the BCE case had already been decided. Um, uh, uh, we were aware and actually built on all of these in um, creating the new paradigm. And I'd say that the new paradigm today is as fresh as it was in 2016 as to uh, what at least I think uh, should be the way in which uh, uh, companies and their investors uh, should uh, engage and how they should view their relationship. And with that, I'll stop. That's the new paradigm. That's how we got there. That's what it is. And um, um, I, I guess I should say, I'm not sure that it's resolved that much. Uh, we'll get to what's happened between 2016 and today, but um, we do not have universal agreement and what corporate and ESG, ESG governance should look like. So no, now no, I'll, I'll I'll stop we on do the not. History. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Ivan, um, you and, and your EGUP uh, colleagues have written extensively uh, on governance and, and on the BCE decision and director's duties in Canada and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you've even developed a framework that Martin quotes in, uh, in, in one of his articles, actually, that I read this summer uh, in the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the Canadian context and, and the model before we dive into the issues? Uh, oui, merci, Marise. Uh, good morning, Martin. Um, it is indeed uh, an honor to be considered a, a friend and a thinking colleague uh, by uh, Martin Lipton. I, um, yes, uh, just to, uh, for the, to start with, I, I think in the history that uh, uh, Martin drew what happened, I agree with most of it, there is one little bit, um, one player that played a significant role at some point, and that was uh, Jensen and his group at Harvard who uh, in the wave of the LBO uh, phenomenon uh, convinced CEOs that they were not paid well enough, that they should be paid more like the managers of privatized uh, company, privatized by private equity uh, fund. And at that point, it started to be a phenomenon of inc 
increase, very steep increase in the remuneration and compensation, which I think is at the heart of many of the problems that we see today when we talk about, uh, obviously, the uh, inequality of wealth, inequality of income. I think behind all of this uh, stakeholder uh, ESG, uh, there is a notion that uh, compensation uh, is an issue. And uh, if we don't address that, um, there will be sharp temptation by government to intervene in that uh, area. And some doubt that there will really be a stakeholder view of companies and stakeholder governance uh, with the current compensation uh, scheme in most organizations where the, uh, the leadership's compensation and quite often the board is linked very directly and substantially to stock prices. And therefore, when there is a choice to be made, the choice may be uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly obvious. But um, to, uh, I'll get back to that because I think it's an important issue on what we have to say. Just to mention about the, the Canadian context, as Marie has pointed out, the Canadian jurisprudence clearly establishes the duty of board to act and make decisions in the interests of the corporation without giving preference to any particular stakeholder, including shareholders. I guess that qualifies as stakeholder governance although the actual impact of that jurisprudence on Canadian governance is minimal uh, because nowhere does the Supreme Court or any other court or any other have stipulated how do you make any trade-off between various uh, stakeholders and, and shareholders. So in the absence of that, there hasn't been much discussion and much effort. We, as you mentioned, Marie's, Stéphane Rousseau and I said, well, it's time to try to give some structure. And we published a piece where we try to say, how should a, a board uh, deal and cope with a situation where, let's say, to be clear, an example, on one hand, there's a plant. We, if we close it, then we move it to uh, whatever, Mexico or somewhere else, there will be a reduction in cost. But of course, that's 250 people will be out of a job the profitability of the company will increase somewhat and therefore shareholders will like that move. Obviously, the employees will not like that move. Uh, how do you make a kind of trade-off between uh, the two in these issues? I saw that Professor Bainbridge, another friend of ours, um, has come out and say well, in that kind of situation, obviously shareholder wealth maximization is the answer that one uh, that the board should uh, apply and uh, which is of course not what I believe and I don't think that's what Martin believes but uh, it there hasn't been many uh, guidelines as to how do you deal with that kind of situation um, I know Martin if you want to comment at this point well I don't think it's possible to have a guideline. The concept was that um, the uh, board of directors would exercise their business judgment just as they have to exercise their business judgment on any matter of strategy that comes before the board, whether it's to move a factory from uh, uh, Ontario to Mexico or uh, move a factory from Detroit to Ontario. You know, these are issues that come up um, and the only way to resolve the issue is that a board of directors uses its business judgment to accomplish the objective of, and here is the difference, maximizing value for shareholders or growing the value of the corporation. Um, the new paradigm 
the view of the purpose and objective of a corporation, which underlies the new paradigm, uh, is that the ultimate goal of the corporation is to grow sustainable long-term value. In many cases, sustainable long-term value will be the same as maximizing shareholder value. In many cases, it won't be. And, but it's left to the judgment of the board of directors and the business judgment rule protects the board of directors. So if the board of directors, and just as you outline in your article, if the board of directors does a careful study and documents the study, however they come out uh, will be sustained in the courts. In other words, uh, what is happening is the decision is relegated to the board of directors. Obviously, ultimately, the shareholders who elect the board of directors can overturn that decision by electing a new board of directors uh, if the shareholders disagree with the decision. And so there's real impetus on the part of both the shareholders and the company to engage in coming to an agreement. I should mention just briefly, I don't want to take too much time on it, the Investors Forum in London. Um, uh, three years, three and a half years ago, uh, the Investors Forum was created by the uh, leading uh, institutional investors in the UK, basically to deal with the FTSE 100 companies on these um, uh, corporate governance and strategy questions. Um, and the Investors Forum is actually a mediator between the institutional investors on one hand and the companies on the other as to how to work out these differences uh, in strategy and operations. But there's no magic formula for it. It has to be worked out in the way all business problems are worked out. People use their business judgment to come up with the best decision as long as they've done it without conflict, being loyal to the ultimate interest of the corporation, uh, the courts sustain it, and that's uh, uh, the way of the world. Yeah, well, I do, I, I should say, I do completely agree with you on compensation. And I'd like to come back to that. Um, well, I will right away, um, because I think for me, it is at the center. If you put the, you know, the business judgment rule, uh, the board will, I guess, do a good job of thinking about these issues. But with the structure of compensation as it is now, certainly for management, sometimes for the board, but certainly for management, uh, don't you think that it tipped the scale a little bit, saying that any move that increases shareholder value makes me richer as, a, as an executive? Any move that doesn't, well, you know, there's a, there's a, an economic penalty. And uh, it's an enormous amount of money, as you know, which are being paid uh, as it relates to stock, uh, stock value and stock option and so on. And how do you... I've, I've lost the, the political issues. Of Sound went off there for a moment. Okay, you got it now? Yes. No, you I, want to repeat your, your, your last question because you were frozen there for a moment. Yeah. Okay, so I was saying that I think that compensation is at the center of the concern and uh, uh, in the political circles and around cooperation. And I think uh, uh, stakeholders, the ESG and all of that is a manifestation of a dissatisfaction about this. 
Well, I, I agree with that. I think that um, um, the um, one of the um, key factors that um, um, run against um, um, and, and why public opinion um, is so low with respect to major corporations is the compensation of the CEO in most cases. Um, uh, and one of the problems is that uh, CEO compensation uh, in comparison to the compensation of the next five key executives uh, always seems to be so out of line uh, that the CEO is being paid uh, um, multiple times what the executive vice presidents who are actually running the company on a day-to-day -day basis are. are the average worker. And uh, of course, when you have the CEO being compensated at a hundred times what the average worker uh, gets, you you get a a reaction. Uh, there's no easy answer. Um, um, the um, clearly everybody is. Uh, better served by a company having the best management that it can get. Um, and um, but I think there's a recognition now um, uh, that uh, by companies that uh, compensation is a key political issue, both big politics and little politics. It's a big political issue with respect to legislatures and government. It's a big political issue with respect to what the average person thinks about it, and so on. And us, some of us have tried to deal with it in various ways. Um, the Aspen Institute um, um, two weeks ago uh, published um, a recommendation that has been in the works for quite some time uh, uh, as to uh, executive compensation, um, recommending that um, it take into account um, ESG factors, stakeholder factors, in other words, that it uh, not be um, based solely on TSR, uh, but it uh, be based on uh, the stakeholder factors, ESG factors, and so on. And um, that um, it um, uh, also be predicated on long term performance. Um, so that there's no pressure uh, on uh, management to create quarterly earnings in order to increase the value of the compensation that depends on market prices on a current basis. And in fact, um, that um, incentive in the form of stock compensation um, uh, not be realizable uh, um, uh, until uh, a significant period as much as five years after um, uh, retirement. So um, uh, there are efforts being made. Um, uh, the Business Roundtable has not endorsed uh, the Aspen uh, recommendation, um, um, uh, nor has the uh, Council on Institutional Investors or the Investor Stewardship Group. Uh, you know, this is a proposal by the, the Aspen Institute. Uh, 
and um, the um, but I think there's a general recollection in boardrooms today that at the very least uh, executive compensation has to meet three criteria one performance two long-term value not short-term value and three um, that um, the ESG issues have been uh, satisfied in other words that a factor in determining compensation is uh, whether the company has set and is meeting climate uh, goals, uh, 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 um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what you know, various metrics, and maybe this is a point where we ought to mention metrics, which. Uh, you do mention in your article that one of the problems in judging uh, allocation among uh, uh, stakeholders when you look at environment as a stakeholder, uh, how do you value the uh, um, uh, what a company has done with respect to uh, environment? Uh, this has been a, you know, um, that's again, not new uh, for at least the last dozen years that have been um, and going even further back uh, as far as the UN is concerned with its principles of responsible investing. Uh, that as they have taken into account um, measuring uh, the impact of the business on ESG factors um, and um, just um, uh, last week um, the um, World Economic Forum uh, published um, its recommendations with respect to metrics to measure uh, just about every factor to be considered in connection with environment, uh, uh, gender, um, uh, equality, uh, um, altogether uh, uh, several dozen, several score factors to be taken into account uh, in um, uh, measuring what a company has done in the way of sustainability and in the way of meeting um, uh, goals uh, from a uh, um, ESG standpoint. Yeah, we do a lot of we do a lot of studies on this on compensation. There is some movement, very timid movement, towards uh, these factors and. The way it's dealt with is, uh, let's put it, is very approximate. Uh, a lot of work to be done uh, before one can say that the structure of compensation has really uh, been changed. And this brings me actually to uh, uh, one of the argument uh, for uh, Milton Friedman's position <laughs> a long time ago, uh, but it's been taken up by a lot of others. It was that uh, any broadening of corporate goals and mission to include social issues would open the door to the imposition by governments of new obligation on corporations. Current critics point to some politicians already toying with the ideas of co-determination, employee representative and board of directors, etc. For instance, of course, another Warren's uh, Accountable Capitalism Act. Um, now, we may agree with, uh, with this uh, direction, uh, but those who are, uh, let's say, less uh, less uh, positive, uh, say, by doing all that, you're opening the door, the government come and say, well, you've opened the door, now we can enact regulation. You want to do it, we'll, we'll make sure that all companies do it in a certain way. Do you have any apprehension, or do you think that's uh, well, a bad argument? 
I mean, it, it's not just with kind; it, it's with everything in a way. There's a tension between uh, companies uh, and shareholders working out um, solutions that are satisfactory to the public or the other way, government imposing on companies and investors um, uh, guidelines, guardrails, uh, 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 laws that um, uh, tell companies and investors exactly uh, what um, what they can do. Uh, I have um, basically uh, uh, been um, uh, a uh, believer in uh, companies, uh, boards of directors, and investors working out these problems uh, through engagement and coming to reasonable decisions. Uh, the failure to do that will result in legislation, and that kind of legislation leads to state corporatism. Uh, and uh, it's something that I think is uh, to be uh, uh, very seriously avoided. Uh, uh, I, I don't know of a single instance of state corporatism that has resulted in um, uh, a um, uh, society that uh, is free of totalitarianism or other problems. So um, the uh, uh, I think it's very important that we be able to work these problems out um, in a reasonable way. And um, I, th I think generally people are doing it, I think. Uh, um, I don't want to jump ahead of you, but I, I just sort of mentioned that um, the um, um, you know, the business roundtable um, in August of last year, uh, embracing um, stakeholder governance, um, is a major, major uh, factor in resolving these issues. Well, uh, that's a good point I wanted to raise. Uh, did they really? Uh, because they uh, were taken aback by the virulent reaction of uh, some investor, I guess. And they came out with a, a clarification. And in this clarification, they say we're not for stakeholder governance, very clearly. Uh, we're not proposing radical change. And essentially, uh, my question was, so what do they mean? What did the business round table actually mean? Because if you look at them, then they start saying, well, we already have the corporate social responsibility statement, which basically covered that. And we sort of uh, brought that up to date. So are we back to the corporate social responsibility uh, mantra uh, under the guise of uh, corporate purpose? Uh, I think. The, the statement that uh, came out um, from the business roundtable, the sequence of events uh, is the business roundtable announced um, its uh, position on stakeholder uh, governance um, and um, Immediately, the Council of Institutional Investors came out with criticism uh, and uh, actually uh, claiming that it was illegal, that it violated the law. Um, and um, the um, uh, roundtable a couple of days after that came out and said, no, we're not violating the law. We're uh, uh, we, we believe that uh, shareholders are uh, stakeholders and uh, I read their statement as basically saying um, uh, what I was
describing before that um, uh, the objective is value of the corporation, it, uh, but we're not there to maximize the value for the shareholders. We're going to take in new account uh, everybody who's involved, but our ultimate goal is growth in the value of the corporation. And um, uh, in large measure, I think that is the key question uh, uh, that we need to deal with with respect to all of these issues. But no, I don't think the business roundtable statement was a withdrawal by any means. Um, I think it was a clarification wanting to not be viewed as totally abandoning uh, shareholders. Um, uh, no one proposes that stakeholder governance abandon, abandon the shareholders. Uh, shareholders are stakeholders uh, and they're very important stakeholders because uh, they're the ones who ultimately uh, are responsible for providing uh, capital to the, to the uh, corporation for its business. Yeah, although it did sound, I must say, reading it, it did uh, seem a little bit uh, of a backtracking, but uh, you're closer to them than I am, so I think uh, what you were saying on that. Um, the, I, I um, it wasn't a little backtracking. There's a little backtracking in there. Whenever somebody issues a clarification, it's always a little backtracking. Yeah, it was. Um, one of the aspects of the, um, uh, the new paradigm, which I think is a good title because uh, in science, paradigm is a, is a uh, how revolutions come about. And revolutions mean going back also to the, what was done before, and there is quite a bit of that. Uh, you mentioned that the 70s and 80s or 60s even, companies were um, basically were stakeholders. Uh, if you read the IBM statement, uh, the Johnson & Johnson's credo was all, uh, in fact, uh, the statement of the of corporate purpose is almost a, a, a copy of the IBM principles of 1960s and 70s. But in your uh, uh, paradigm, you uh, put a lot of emphasis on asset managers. And uh, one of the questions I think has been raised is uh, asset managers are, of course, hugely important now. They represent, depending on how you calculate that, but certainly the index fund represent over 20% of all shares. Um, they take position on ESG, very, um, very vigorous position on ESG, almost all of them. The question is, should they have to consult the people who give them money to manage, see if they agree with those positions? Or, I mean, you know, everyone has to consult uh, its stakeholders, but their stakeholders are the people who uh, give them this money to manage, and yet they take positions they strong positions how they uh, shouldn't they uh, shouldn't they be uh, asked to uh, to check out to check up with their uh, constituencies and uh, I have somewhere here uh, a datum that I want to uh, provide to you uh, yeah it's uh, it's from uh, John Coffey you know well Colombia uh, he reports on a study surveying 310 fiduciaries of pension fund and trust and found that 47% believe that the use of ESG criteria either conflicted or might conflict with their fiduciary duty. And um, so I think it's an issue that I am uh, putting forward for you. Um, should the asset managers uh, uh, consult their uh, their stakeholders or uh, well, taking position. Uh, yes, in, in um, I should really explain. Um, 
And I think uh, there's a fairly good example in um, the um, new uh, 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 rules on stewardship of the Financial Reporting Council um, in the UK, which um, uh, asset managers and institutional investors are required to, if they're going to comply with um, the Financial Reporting Council uh, rules, uh, to describe exactly what their policy is with respect to ESG and long-term investment and whether um, they're uh, supporting activists or not. If you go back to the new paradigm, the stewardship principles in the new paradigm are basically that the investor, asset managers and institutional investors disclose so that the ultimate beneficiaries can choose whether there's uh, which asset manager they want to have managed their money and so on. Uh, I stop short of, because I think it's not practical uh, for uh, asset managers um, to actually solicit uh, the uh, ultimate beneficiaries. When you look at asset managers managing uh, the uh, funds of pension plans and endowments, and so you get too many layers. Uh, the institutional investors uh, and shareholders, a, a typical mutual fund um, discloses exactly what its policies are. And um, uh, I do believe that um, uh, asset managers should uh, disclose and indeed should be required to disclose. I think most of them now are required to disclose exactly what their policies are. And um, as has in recent years uh, been the case, uh, uh, very successful asset managers have been established uh, on the basis that uh, uh, they are investing in companies that um, meet ESG um, goals and um, that um, the um, uh, one of the um, uh, re one of the proposed requirements uh, that being, that's being put forward currently is um, that uh, uh, companies in, that investment managers and institutional investors improve their disclosure with respect to their policy on sustainability, long-term uh, investment, ESG factors. And um, it, uh, I just mentioned uh, just how significant this has become to companies. Uh, in just about two weeks ago, uh, the CEO of uh, Rio Tinto, one of the largest mining companies in the world, no way. <laughs> uh, was forced to resign uh, because Rio Tinto uh, destroyed um, uh, a uh, area that was a shrine to uh, the original inhabitants of, of the area. And... Um, uh, we've seen all sorts of instances over the past uh, few years of um, corporate management being forced to resign. That's not the first one. Um, or um, companies um, having great difficulty with customers or the public uh, for failing to meet uh, 
uh, climate or other ESG type standards. Um, it, yeah. uh, I think we're in the midst of an accelerating public recognition of the importance of stakeholder governance by major corporations and uh, the importance of uh, um, their uh, compliance with uh, um, uh, ESG factors. I, uh, I like Colin Mayer's formulation of what the purpose of a corporation ought to be to uh, 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 provide solutions uh, uh, for people and planet without doing damage, uh, profitable solutions for people and planet without doing harm to either. Um, in a way, that's a short summary of what I think the uh, future framework of the public corporation is. Uh, he, act, he is uh, the um, uh, director of the uh, yeah. future of the corporation um, uh, study by the British Academy. And uh, that phrase has been adopted by the British Academy as uh, the, um, the purpose of uh, the public corporations. Yeah, I have uh, Colin Mayer's statement uh, in following what he's doing. Uh, one of them, or a version, is the purpose of business, which is to solve the problems of people and planet profitably. Uh, and then he contrasts purpose, and that's where I'd like to. He contrasts because uh, most organizations have statements of value, mission, vision already. And uh, then he goes on to try to articulate the difference between that purpose and values, which articulate all the organization behaves, mission, which sets out what the organization does, and vision, which describes where the organization intends to have impact. Um, I don't know. I find that's a lot of statements. <laughs> Where he goes on, he does go on uh, to say that it basically it should be uh, established by legislation. And <laughs> I, I part company with him. I yeah. general agreement with his objectives. Uh, I do not agree that they are uh, they should be imposed by legislation um, um, and um, we have a, a situation uh, uh, two um, organizations B lab and uh, the shareholder Commons these are two organizations that basically um, uh, have been promoting uh, ESG and um, and stakeholder governance and uh, in the past week or so they they have come out with proposals for extensive this is all in the U.S. extensive regulation amending the securities laws the yeah. you know just uh, kind of everything gets amended to meet these objectives of uh, 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 risk, the principles of responsible investing uh, and so on. And uh, to me, that's uh, that state corporatism uh, and uh, should be avoided. But it doesn't mean that it should not be part of the objective of um, uh, of um, uh, companies and um, and uh, investors to achieve those those goals. Um, I'm um, a consultant on. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you are also um, on this uh, enactment of um, a purpose uh, 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 group that that uh, that Colin is. 
uh, one of the leaders of uh, it's headquartered at uh, Oxford. Um, the um, um, uh, basic uh, uh, focus of what they're proposing is that the boards of directors of companies take over uh, the definition of the purpose of the company. And um, uh, in effect, it ties in with some of the things that have been uh, issued in the last three years by Larry Fink of uh, BlackRock uh, with respect to the purpose of the corporation. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in a way, uh, uh, if you look at 2008, starting from scratch uh, on changing uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Milton Friedman to date, um, except for a few holdouts like our friend Deb Chuck at Harvard, uh, I think a very significant majority of uh, academics and people who have been focusing on this uh, uh, um, throughout the Western world and even spreading now into um, uh, um, uh, Asia. Uh, very significant things in uh, India and in uh, Japan. Uh, Martin, Martin, your your George Leo Stein, who's now your colleague, sort of says that doesn't go far enough. This purpose, and uh, you, you would like to see um, political donation without shareholder consent to be part of the, the consideration. Uh, a broader role for compensation committees, so they look at compensation of all employees, not only executives. Uh, look at income tax optimization, quote unquote. Um, you think that's um, it's a good idea to broaden uh, the consideration? I didn't get the question, Ron. I said, uh, your colleague, Leo Stein, yeah. I said, it doesn't go far enough. Uh, we should add uh, statements about political donation without shareholder consent. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I, I missed it. Yeah, yeah. Compensation uh, committee with a broader role to look at compensation of all employees, not only executives, and income tax optimization. Uh, I radical stuff. I don't agree and I don't disagree. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, the, um, I do think that um, uh, corporations should not make political contributions. Um, um, basically, I think it's just wrong for business corporations to make uh, political contributions. Uh, um, uh, you end up with a situation where um, uh, in effect, money is buying political. Um, uh, but they do it massively uh, in the U.S. That, uh, that um, I think it ties in very closely with maximizing shareholder uh, value. Um, so I, I, I do. Uh, there are aspects of what he goes for that I'm not enthusiastic for. But the fundamental question of limiting uh, corporate participation in politics. Um, uh, he and I are on the same page. Uh, the, um, uh, well, uh, just uh, leave, it, leave it at that. We're, we're on the same page. I, I, do, uh, I do have a great problem with political donations by uh, business corporations. A quick question, Martin. We're getting to question period just very briefly. I forgot to ask you on compensation. We, uh, Doug Frank mandated the uh, say on pay. Uh, we have that in Canada also, mostly, not mandatory. Do you think it helped in any way? I didn't think, I don't think it's made a, a difference. Um, 
Hey, Bon. I, I don't. I, uh, it's a big deal in the boardroom. An even bigger deal in the boardroom is uh, uh, the threat that ISS Glass Lewis will recommend uh, uh, yeah. against uh, 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 voting for members of the um, compensation committee. I, I think the uh, the withhold of the vote on members of the compensation committee is, is a bigger factor than say on pay. Uh, yeah, that was that was. That was our position here also at EGOP. So <laughs> I, didn't I, think see, I didn't see once, you know, bottom line, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm a corporate lawyer representing corporations, and I'm there trying to uh, uh, protect my clients and get the best possible things for them. Um, I'm not out to reform everything. I do think things have to be reformed if we're going to have uh, um, uh, corporations function uh, outside of state corporatism. Uh, so I do think if um, you know uh, uh, people uh, who are strong believers in uh, uh, the corporate approach to um, uh, uh, economics uh, and uh, believe that um, the kind of competitive markets that we have uh, evolved over the last hundred years or so uh, have created this great wealth and so on. If they want to preserve that, they have to use their common sense wow. and moderate things like compensation, things like interference with um, um, politics, uh, uh, particularly party politics. Uh, I also think that their uh, uh, tax arbitrage is a huge problem. Um, of, uh, in the US, states competing with each other uh, uh, to gain factories and businesses moving in by promising low taxes. I think on a global basis, it's a huge problem uh, uh, of countries competing to um, uh, uh, get uh, businesses located in the countries by uh, reducing taxes on uh, uh, corporations and so on. So some of these things are not easily resolved um, uh, by discussion and negotiation among um, companies and, and their shareholders, investors, and so on. Um, I do think that over the years, um, and you've been intimately involved in, in the World Economic Forum and the International Business Council. I think uh, the World Economic Forum and um, the UN, with its uh, principles of responsible investing, have uh, really uh, proposed very important uh, principles uh, to be adopted by companies, to be adopted by countries. Uh, the unfortunate thing is uh, we haven't adopted most of them. I do think we're now in a period where we're making progress, but it's been a long time to get to this point where we're making progress and the progress is not uniform and I'm not sure it's going to hold up much of it uh, is connected to politics, uh, uh, both local and uh, national uh, politics, and those things aren't that easy to resolve. I think we have a question. Eva, yeah. we have we have lots of questions. Um, actually, we have. Uh, I my, hope we my have lots of answers. Is lighting up. 
Um, I guess the, the prerogative of the moderator is, is I can ask my own question first. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, just to go back to the, the stakeholder governance um, uh, paradigm, one of the criticism has been that having sort of ill-defined criteria other than maximizing shareholder value is just a, an opportunity to give cover for incompetent executives. Um, and that it's also an opportunity for them to pursue personal agendas. Uh, Esther Pierce, the SEC commissioner, has actually said, uh, and I quote, it's actually quite colorful, Virtue, virtue signaling to earn societal brownie points gives executive social circles a greater say in corporate policies than shareholders. It is no different for a corporate executive to claim to be virtuous by spending shareholder money than it is for a politician to signal her generosity by spending taxpayer money. So what's 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 the answer to that to that charge that this is mission creep and that and it it's a cover for incompetence engagement uh, uh, goes right back to the uh, new paradigm uh, uh, institutional investors and asset managers have to exercise their uh, responsible um, voting power. Uh, the whole idea of the new paradigm, uh, the whole idea of stakeholder governance uh, is that um, there, there is a um, process that between the shareholders who have the power, they elect the board and the board and management to engage and come to a, an agreed solution. So it's up to it's up to the shareholders to uh, uh, police um, uh, the management with respect to uh, performance and so on. And if um, uh, the uh, shareholders determine that uh, uh, stakeholder governance is uh, being used as a, uh, an excuse for poor performance. They have a ready remedy. They elect new directors. Yeah, well, you usually add to that uh, the imperial CEO. Well, we, we're back to the imperial CEO with that. The same argument was used with uh, activist hedge fund, LBO hostile takeover, uh, all measures to protect against hostile takeover have always been seen as protection of the board and protection of the CEO and uh, making them impervious to the will of shareholders was the same line of argument. Uh, Yvonne, I, 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 I do disagree. I think we've moved from the era of the imperial CEO to the era of the imperial uh, asset manager. Uh, no, I agree. I was just saying that they say it's going to bring us back this uh, uh, purpose I mean, it, and all that. It will bring it, us back to the imperial CEO, not that we are now. We're supposed not to be at that stage. Anyway. Well, that's actually a, a good segue to one of the questions that I've received is um, today also uh, as part of the that whole diversity movement that's uh, taking boards over by storm. Uh, is the issue of, uh, of women representation on boards, but uh, more broadly, uh, diverse uh, members being represented on board? Um, what what is 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 the fact that there are more women and more uh, perhaps visible minorities getting on board? Is that going to change the paradigm somehow? Somehow move it away from the old boys network? Yes, I think it will. I think it will. I think uh, uh, um, um, diversity um, uh, will have an impact. I think uh, the real impact comes um, from the realization by uh, the public that uh, business 
has this huge impact on their lives and that it's something that uh, you pay attention to. I, I do think that um, I, my experience spans um, God, uh, 60 odd years. Uh, and uh, from when I first started um, to today, there's just a, uh, I'd say, a 180 degree turn uh, from um, the view of um, a corporation um, and where the power lies in a corporation. My early exposure to companies, uh, the board consisted of a CEO, uh, three or four executive vice presidents, and maybe two or three independent directors. Uh, it was just a different world. And um, I'm not so sure it wasn't a better world. Uh, those are the companies that really created uh, the great industrial economy that some of the economists point to as uh, the result of uh, shareholder uh, primacy. Those were not shareholder primacy days. Those, those were days of um, people getting together and, um, and working for an objective uh, uh, and, um, uh, and, and creating great business success. One other question is, um, and at Ivan, it, it perhaps is uh, better addressed by you. If there is no remedy for stakeholders, other than in Canada, at least creditors and security holders, how do you how do you keep management or the uh, executives accountable for their stewardship over? Uh, their stakeholder management. They're, they they don't have any right of action. Well, there's um, well, first of all, I think someone should uh, inform either the governor that they would in the vision of the law they just did, or the Supreme Court uh, to include other stakeholders uh, in the remedies. Um, of course, um, some of them can claim to have a remedy by becoming shareholders. Uh, and always have a, a union being shareholders and claiming as a as a union that they have access to uh, the oppression remedy. But uh, essentially, it has never been uh, tested in court. And one way to test it, I've been proposing that for uh, for a while. I mean, in Canada, we don't have to just say no uh, to an hostile takeover. Um, the uh, Securities uh, administration have decided that uh, any offer has to be sent to shareholders and they vote on it and that's it. Well, that's not what the Supreme Court said in its statement. I'm very surprised if there was a hostile takeover, attempt to take over, that the board shouldn't go to the court and say, look, we have the authorities, securities say that we can't do anything, we just have to say to we disagree with the offer, but you have to vote by selling your shares. But yeah, the Supreme Court says as a board, we're supposed to look at all stakeholders involved. Which is it? Which is it? Which is the most, uh, uh, to what are we responsible? To the Supreme Court's decision or to the authorities, uh, the securities authorities uh, statement? And that would be a, a, an instance of really testing what the court meant by stakeholder. And that's a very important point which should be tested by lawyers. I have a lot of fans of our lawyers. I hope that one of them will go and test that at some point. Well, I'm sure uh, there are a lot of lawyers listening, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, looking at the time, uh, we're getting to the end of our, of our session and, and, and uh, I'm going to have to thank the, both of you sincerely for, for this uh, very rich exchange this morning. I think we could probably have gone on for another half hour. 
but I will just turn it briefly to uh, Hélène, uh, the president of our chapter, for, for the final word, because we're at 11.59. Thank you. No sound. Hélène, est tu sur mute? Okay, thank you. Merci, Marise. Thank you, Mr. Lipton. Thank you, Mr. Allaire. Uh, we were delighted to have you this morning for our first panel, virtual panel, in collaboration with uh, EGUP and ICD Quebec. So again, a great honor to have you as such a great caliber uh, and the exchange were fantastic. So uh, thanks for your generosity and your time this morning. I'm sure all our members uh, really appreciated the, the conversation this morning. Bonjour, mon nom est Hélène Barsalou. Je suis euh, directrice générale à la Financière Banque Nationale et également présidente et, euh, et directrice générale de l'IAS Québec. Donc, euh, en mon nom personnel et au nom de toute l'équipe, je voudrais vous remercier euh, d'avoir participé à l'événement de ce matin. Euh, dans les périodes euh, un peu plus difficiles que nous vivons, euh, je tiens à vous rassurer que l'IAS euh, veut poursuivre sa mission auprès des administrateurs de sociétés d'ici, ainsi que les dirigeants, pour fournir du contenu de, de qualité et euh, nous assurer qu'on qu euh, continue d'être axé sur euh, les préoccupations dans un monde en changement. Donc, en attendant des, un retour à la normale, euh, ces événements virtuels seront un des moyens que l'IAS euh, euh, a trouvé pour demeurer le haut lieu d'échanges en matière de gouvernance de société. Donc, je vous invite à consulter notre nouveau site Internet dans les prochaines semaines afin de voir euh, les, la programmation des euh, prochains panels virtuels qui auront lieu cet automne. Euh, un petit mot sur nos partenaires de saison. Une fois encore, merci de votre support. Euh, L'événement de ce matin n'aurait pas pu être euh, possible sans vous. Donc, euh, merci à tous pour votre support continu. Euh, si, pour ceux qui ne sont pas membres de l'IAS, si vous voulez devenir, euh, je vous invite à vous, euh, à vous abonner euh, pour euh, bénéficier de tous les avantages que l'Institut euh, euh, peut vous, euh, vous donner, euh, soit par un abonnement individuel ou par un membership corporatif. Donc, euh, en terminant, encore une fois, merci de votre participation. Merci d'avoir été présent. Euh, nous sommes déjà euh, à programmer le prochain panel virtuel et euh, nous avons hâte de vous y accueillir très prochainement. Merci. Bonne fin de journée. Thank you all. Thank Martin, you, Thank you both. It was a privilege. It was, yeah. it was a privilege.